Hello and welcome to this fireside chat on technology and engineering. I'm joined today by three individuals who've all played a key role in the 5G New Thinking project to share their um, experience, thoughts and expertise with us. So let's meet each of our speakers this afternoon um, and find out a little bit about who they are and what their role in the 5G New Thinking project has been. So Des, coming to you first, please. Hi, uh, yes, I'm Des O'Connor. I work for Cisco. I'm in a global um, role for 5G and mobility, developing that business. And um, I, I work as a CTO function within the 5G New Thinking project. Thank you. And Kenny? Hi, uh, so my name is Kenny Barley. Um, I'm a researcher at the University of Strathclyde, and I do a lot of the RAND design uh, part of the 5G New Thinking project. Brilliant. Thank you. And Greg? I'm Greg Whitten, the director of CloudNet, who's the local uh, internet service provider up in Orkney, providing the infrastructure, the build out and the, the, the go to for the 5G program here. Brilliant. Thank you. So I think let's start right at the beginning and go back to basics with what is different about 5G? So what do rural communities need to understand about what's new or unique about 5G? And um, Kenny, maybe I'm going to come to you first on that. But Greg does j- jump in as, as, as you want. Yes. Yeah, so 5G, on the face of it, 5G is very similar to 4G. It is an evolution of the standard. It is mm-hmm. still using the same same low level modulation schemes and all that kind of stuff. It just basically takes it one step further. So what that means is you can get bigger bandwidths and higher throughputs of your base stations. Um, there is a, an evolution in the core architecture as well. So 4G and what are called 5G non-standalone, 5G NSA cores, that's all sort of on the, the 4G ecosystem, which is about 10 years old. The 5G, the pure 5G standalone core, um, it's a different technology. Brilliant, thank you. And Des, you know, in your day-to-day role, you obviously spend a lot of time talking to people about 5G. How would you kind of define what those key distinct differences are? Well, I guess a couple of things particularly pertinent to this project, which is um, addressing rural communities. Uh, is, one is it's released more spectrum, and um, spectrum is being released in slightly different ways, meaning it's possible for um, communities to actually access some of that spectrum. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing I would say is it's it's disaggregated the software from the hardware, which means that we can widen the ecosystem and we can bring in all sorts of different players into the marketplace of, 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 of systems that we use to build it. And just to build on that last point, Des, why would that be important for rural communities? What does that suddenly mean that they can do that they perhaps couldn't before? Yeah, well, you know, you get kind of tier one um, vendors who sell, you know, relatively expensive kit with very high levels of reliability and capability um, to the largest operators in the world. And I, I guess, you know, Cisco is one of the vendors who sell in that space. But but then, you know, you can get other tiers of vendors who can kind of um, sell much more now into the kind of into the kind of specifics and nuances of these of of these smaller networks mm-hmm. who won't have the same buying power but nevertheless you know have have important needs that that need to be addressed brilliant thank you um so in terms of then thinking about if you are a rural community you want to go about kind of constructing a local 5g network what are the main kind of building blocks that you need to have to be able to do that and greg maybe i'll come to you first on that one please okay for uh, the main building blocks typically is is to, to try and maximize the coverage in the rural community so that you're, you're trying to cover as much of the area as you can with height so obviously we need to we need to get some kind of good leverage and good height for for putting uh, cell sites up but then obviously you've then got to build into having the, the technology and, and actually the infrastructure in place to deliver that so there's a good number of aspects that you need to consider when building uh, small networks like this mm-hmm. And Kenny, you obviously have spent a lot of time um, doing exactly this in, in Orkney as part of 5G New Thinking. What are the sort of the key elements that, that you think sort of any viewers today need to be thinking about? Um, so, Kenny, in terms of the different sort of design choices that, that, that are available, what kind of things do people need to be sort of thinking about or considering? OK, so for your design choices, um 
depending on the use case, it's going to have uh, some implications on the what your RAN is looking like and what your core network is looking like. Now, if you are running a use case that's doing fixed wireless access, for example, you're going to want to be dumping user data to the internet as fast as possible. So that means you're probably going to want uh, an edge user plane, which has some implications in what the core looks like. If you're running an IoT network, you're probably going to, um, again, so they have a, a different architecture where you're probably going to want to be funneling data to a central point in the cloud. Mm -hmm. Um, depending on whether you're supporting mo uh, mobile networks, um, you know, for sort of standard handsets, you're maybe going to want some 4G with uh, 5G non-standalone cells. If you're uh, building a purely 5G network, you're going to have 5G standalone. And, you know, there's, there's slight differences in how it's all set up. Mm -hmm. And again, we talk through all of that in the toolkit. So does hearing what Kenny was just kind of explaining just there then, do you think it's fair to say that actually the, the first stage in designing a network is to really be clear about what it is you actually want to use the network for? Absolutely, yes. The use cases will define pretty much everything from the type of spectrum, the amount of power you can broadcast the spectrum, how high up Greg might be climbing up poles to put, to put um, antennas. It, it, it's pretty much fundamental, in, including... How many use cases you want to stack on each on top of each other to make the business case work? So you might want to do fixed wireless access plus provide mobile coverage at the same time. And if you want to do that, you probably need what we call con contiguous coverage, mm -hmm. meaning you can't have gaps in between all the cells you're building because you're trying to make something so that people can be mobile as they walk through the area. Yes. Okay. And then building on that, then is there also a, an element of it's important to think from the start about kind of building a network that's like future proofed or actually do you think that it makes more sense to sort of start small and then kind of build it out on the basis that you might not really know what people are going to use it for until they have the connectivity? Our, our impression so far, I think, is you've, you've got to be pretty clued up about what you're building for mm -hmm. because that guides the price and the cost of the build. And you really need to know what sort of revenue you're going to be pulling from the network. Otherwise, the, the, these builds can be rather marginal. So you have yeah. to know where you get where you want to get to. Yeah. Okay, brilliant. That's really helpful. So really kind of unpacking all of those needs up, up front, that's important. Um, and then, you know, we've talked already and uh, around quite a lot of technical content. How much technical expertise do you think it's actually necessary to have in the community? Or is it more about equipping communities to be able to have meaningful conversations with specialists, you know, like all of your good selves? And I'll open that up to the, to the broader group to see what people's views and, and perspectives on that are. Yeah, I think communities, there's more of a sense in the communities that they would love to deliver, have a service delivered for them because technically they may not understand what it is they're asking for. Mm -hmm. All they know is, and all they're particularly interested in is communications and, and, better, and better broadband. Typically people mention it as Wi-Fi. So I think it's important that there's, there's an open channel through the toolkit that if anybody wants to do it themselves, the information's there, but ultimately they need to then rely on the specialists that Toolkit can then offer, offer folk. Yeah. And Kenny and Des, does that sort of mirror your perspectives and views on that as well? Yeah, I mean, it, it's probably unlikely that there are 5G network building experts out in the rural communities. <laughs> um, it would be great but, if so, but yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The likes of um, small smaller operators that are in communities already and the WISPs, um, such as CloudNet, you know, they have a great deal of experience of delivering networks like this. It's just a slightly different technology. You know, deep down, they're still carrying IP traffic. And, you know, that, that's something that they're experts in. And there are a lot of these smaller operators dotted all around the country. So there will be someone that is local to your community. And they're probably the people that you should approach in first instance and then pull in the 5G experts. And Des, would you agree with what kind of Greg and, and Kenny have said there? Yes, absolutely. That's that. That seems right. Um, every now and again, there's a genius in a community who can probably do all of this stuff themselves. But I wouldn't even put myself in that in that category. <laughs> but there's lots of things for the community do, to do. Right? They, they've, yeah. they've got to build the coalition. They've got yes. to figure out why leaves and 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 you know how to go and get places and to put masts and lots of stuff that community definitely can do. But yeah. the, the really detailed nuts and bolts of five G probably won't be for everybody. 
Yeah, absolutely. And it sounds like from what we've said, actually, probably the most important thing is to have those meaningful conversations is to have a really clear view of this is what we want to use it for, even if we don't know what the, what the thing is to enable us to do that. So I think that's probably the key takeaway from anyone kind of watching this um, this session. Um, going back to what we were talking about at the top of um, this discussion, we were talking about what was kind of different about 5G. Um, and I wanted to kind of dig into how the development of cloud solutions is changing accessibility to this technology and if that makes it more accessible specifically for rural communities. I think it will do. So, you know, Cisco have just released a kind of a private 5G um, cloud solution, which you know, the whole the whole concept of that is you, you don't know about any of these three GPP kind of boxes and functions mm -hmm. that that are so complicated, and it's all managed as a service from the cloud. So, um, you know, there's there's definitely changes that are going on that are going to make these things simpler. It's never going to be entirely simple though. Even you know, if if you talk to Kenny about some of the complexities around just making different handsets work. Mm. the 5g network that in itself would seem like the easy bit it's not yeah yeah okay so essentially it's about accepting that there is a, an inherent degree of complexity and relying on the specialist local to you to help you navigate that seems to be what we're saying there um, one of the other things I wanted to talk about, we've talked about a lot of a lot of kits today and a lot of different elements of technology. You know, as a country, we are heading to net zero. This all sounds like it could be quite energy intensive. And I wonder what for communities who are very focused on that, what the kind of sustainability credentials are for this type of network and whether or not there are any differences again with 5G versus other types of networks that people should be aware of or that might reassure them if they are concerned about this. So it's definitely possible to run the likes of a 5G base station site off of renewables. Um, if you are uh, you're building a cell tower or whatever, um, you're maybe going to have a street cabinet or a small sort of container unit or whatever that's your site office, covering that in solar panels, putting a wee wind turbine up. You know, you can probably generate enough energy to keep the thing going. Mm -hmm. The higher power uh, base stations, uh, which are transmitting uh, sort of over greater distances, they obviously will use more power. Mm -hmm. um, and if you are having very high throughputs, that will use a lot of computing resources. So um, that, that will crank up the power consumption. Mm -hmm. um, the five G kit in general, you know, compared to some of the, the the other technologies that have been used traditionally in rural communities, um, is a bit more energy intensive. You know, some of the the Wi Fi based fixed wireless access uh, equipment um, runs over what's called power over Ethernet. It's you know very mm -hmm. low voltage, uses very little power. Um, so it, again, it all just comes back to your your use cases, really, you know, for what you want. Yeah, to and I suppose there's a certain with. degree in there is with as with everything that we seem to have discussed today is that actually, if you're looking at the bigger picture, which is actually what what is that connectivity enabling you to do, and is that enabling people to travel less, do something more efficiently? That actually, in that bigger picture, you need to be considering that. Yeah, I mean, I would add, I would add to what Kenny's saying is that we're moving to the future, so we're mm -hmm. having to look at renewables. Yeah. Um, and in and, and, and rural communities now, there's a lot more wind and solar and also mm -hmm. tidal power coming into everything now. So I, I suspect that when communities are coming together, they will have community turbines. So, you know, the way to do it is the communities would be then be looking to utilize the, the electricity that's being generated from the turbines when they're curtailed, which means that they're not actually allowed to transmit power to the, to the grid they can then turn that into uh, energy for use of running these cell sites for the community. So there's a lot more benefits when it's come to this net zero. Um, yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, that's really interesting perspective on it, Greg. Thank you. Um, so I think for, for anyone watching this, I think the key takeout is um, it sounds a little bit like this is quite complex, but don't be scared because there are people here who can help you. Um, what I would like to do is come around to each of you and just kind of um, hear your uh, one word of wisdom. So what's the key kind of takeaway that you would like any rural communities watching this to, to know or to consider about tech and engineering? Um, and Des, I'm going to come to you first, please. Um, I would say don't be scared of the complexity which is inherent in a system or a solution like this. The toolkit is designed to some extent to help you work 
gently through that complexity mm -hmm. and at least make some initial decisions quite quickly without having to get right into the nuts and bolts. Brilliant. Thank you. Uh, Kenny, over to you. Yep. So the thing I would say is figure out your use cases early on because mm -hmm. um, your use cases really define the technology. If you go in saying, I'm building a 5G network and then try and fit the use cases around that, it's not necessarily going to be the perfect solution for you. Yeah, and I guess there's a there's a piece in there as well about also not being too wed to whether it's 5G or whether it's something else, right? It's, yeah. it's you know, you figure out what you want to do and let the experts tell you what the best form of connectivity is to solve that problem. Yeah, yeah definitely. Brilliant. Thank you. And Greg, words, final words of wisdom from you, please. I would say for communities agnostic, don't worry about the technology. If you want mm -hmm. to do the, if you want something aim for delivering what you would like and as Kenny said use case it and you know build the network what you would like it to do not not go with technology so those of you watching I would encourage you to take the time to um, have a look through and delve into the toolkit um, it's based on the expertise and experience of people such as our speakers today um, but a variety of partners from across the 5G New Thinking project um, based on a real world experience of deploying 5G networks in the remote and uh, rural Orkney Islands. Thank you very much for my guests today for sharing their insights and experiences Des, Kenny and Greg. Thank you.